Hello, my name is James Blackwell and I'm an academic F2 at Royal Derby Hospital. Today I'm joined by Dr Tim Watkins, who's a consultant and anaesthetist also at Royal Derby Hospital. Hello Tim. Hello. This podcast is about the fundamentals of arterial blood gases and it's a two-part series, so this is part one. The learning objectives of this podcast are to understand what an arterial blood gas is and why we perform the test and also to understand the common components of the ABG report. I should explain that in everyday use on the wards, the arterial blood gas is often called an ABG for short. So, first of all, what is an ABG? It's a blood test that is done to assess the partial pressure of uh, various gases, typically oxygen and carbon dioxide within the patient's blood. also looks at the pH of the patient's blood, and you can get several other... Um, bits of information about the patients, such as a couple of their electrolytes, their haemoglobin, and various other, other um, laboratory findings. It can be done at the point of patient care quite often, so you don't have to wait for a laboratory to receive and process the sample. Okay, so in some respects it's a bit more immediate and maybe useful in certain situations than a, a regular blood test. Yeah, I mean it, it doesn't give you a full um, sort of remit or gambit of all of the tests that are available in the laboratory, but it can typically give you blood results quicker. Okay. Um, and the times that I've used an ABG before has been somebody that um, is maybe in respiratory compromise or something that we don't think is very well post-surgically. Yeah. Um, in anaesthetics, you use them quite regularly, do you? Um, I mean, ideally, you wouldn't have to, I suppose, but it's a it is a good way to assess. Um, the acid base status of a patient to formally confirm their sort of oxygenation um, as well as as I say because you can find out information about haemoglobin um, and other electrolyte abnormalities as, as well as potentially things like glucose and lactate levels uh, it can give what is sometimes relevant information relatively quickly okay um, and just briefly um, this isn't going to be a, a podcast on how to take an arterial blood gas but uh, the big differences between venipuncture and arterial blood gas, stating the obvious, is that it's from an artery, yep. not a vein. Yep. Um, and the normal site is from the radial artery. I mean, in theory, you can you can take a sample from any um, any artery, artery you can find. I suppose the most common site is the radial artery, but you can take it from a femoral line. You can take it from pulses in the feet. You, you know, you can even process a venous sample, um, allowing for the fact that you would know it is a venous sample, hopefully, to find out information about things like hemoglobin and your electrolytes. Mm -hmm. And that's what we call a, a VBG. In Indeed. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. I thought I'd just include uh, a couple of bits of information here, in that uh, for those of you that haven't taken an arterial blood gas before, once you go to the machine and pop it into the machine, there's a couple of things you need to know about the patient because it changes the results and how you'd interpret those results. Um, so first is the the most recent temperature that you have for the patient and also you need to know what inspired oxygen they have. So if somebody's on room air we know that that's 21%. Uh, two litres by nasal specs is roughly 28%. Four litres by nasal specs is 36%. And the pictures here just show um, different types of venturi mask that we use on the wards and quite how what the different colours equate to in oxygen. Okay, so if we move on to um, the components of the ABG report, when it prints out the machine, uh, as you can see in the example here, you get a plethora of different results, um, and it's important, obviously, to know what these are. Um, so if we start at the top, uh, the pH. It's the um, a reflection of the level of acidemia or alkalosis within the blood. Um, it's a logarithmic expression of the hydrogen concentration. Okay, and the normal range there in brackets is 7.35 to 7.45. Um, then the next one is the PaO2. Yeah, which um, obviously has a normal range. This is one of the most important bits and uh, components of the ABG to um, assess as hypoxia um, is a threat to life. Okay, and the usual range there is uh, over 11. Um, a good bit of information we were told the other day on the ALS course was that um, your PO2 should be approximately 10 lower than the uh, fraction of inspired yeah. oxygen. So if somebody's 
on 60%, then their PO2 should in fact be 50%. And if it's not, then that suggests some sort of respiratory compromise. Uh, the PACO2. Um, so obviously the body, um, through its metabolic processes, produces CO2 and that is ventilated out of the body. Um, in situations where ventilation is impaired, that can um, accumulate in the body and that can cause an acidosis. Um, and the converse obviously is where patients hyperventilate through one reason under another, blowing off more CO2 and therefore causing an alkalosis. Okay. Um, so moving on then, then we have the, the bicarbonate, um, normal range 22 to 26. Yeah, so this is more of a metabolic side of the ABG. Um, the bicarbonate is um, alkalotic and so if you have more of it, then it trends your pH to a higher level. Um, this is sometimes also looked at in conjunction with the base excess, which really is the excess of base. So if you have a more positively, positive base excess, then you're more likely to have a more metabolic uh, alkalosis. Okay, so the, the bicarb and the base excess tend to follow each other, is that correct? Um, typically, in as much as they both reflect the metabolic components of the um, acidosis or acidemia. Okay. And uh, lactate is next on the list. Now, I've seen the surgeons be very interested in lactate before. Um, why is this so? So lactate is something that is often measured on the blood gas. Um, the reason why the body produces lactate most commonly is a result of um, inability for oxygen delivery to the tissues therefore the tissues are forced to go into anaerobic um, respiration. There are other forms of lactate production from the liver but then by, by far not as common as, as that first issue. So if you have a patient who's for one reason or another not delivering oxygen to their tissues their lactate will typically rise um, as a result of anaerobic respiration. So a, la a raised or, or high lactate level is typically associated with a patient with um, end organ hypoperfusion. Okay. So there's a few other things at the bottom there um, that you can get from your blood gas. Uh, Hemoglobin results, oxygen saturations and electrolytes. Um, one thing I was wondering was if you've inadvertently taken a venous sample, what would be the clues uh, that this might be a venous sample and not in fact an arterial sample. Okay, so you mentioned yourself about ALS suggestions um, regarding what the arterial uh, um, alveolar gradient should be. Um, in essence, your hemoglobin and electrolytes won't be particularly different between venous and arterial sites. However, if you've taken a venous sample, um, obviously depending upon where the venous sample is, you'll have a lower saturation, so mixed venous blood may have and oxygen saturations of uh, say 70-75% whereas arterial blood in, in a normal otherwise healthy patient you'd expect um, in the high ends of the 90s. So it gives you a gauge as to where it's from. Mm -hmm. Okay. So to summarise what we've covered in this podcast, we've looked at what an ABG is and why we would perform the test and also we've run through the common components of the ABG report. So thank you very much Dr Watkins. My pleasure.